thank you for the invitation. Um, let me begin by uh, a kind of motif for my short talk, uh, which is from a pop song. And some of you may know the pop song with the refrain, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Uh, it was a very popular song in the 1970s. Uh, of course, it was about a drifter, drugs, and uh, the usual smear. But for me, it always had a deeper resonance, this rather pathos-filled refrain of reflecting uh, the disassociation from um, successful or prosperous society in the richer democracies from those at the bottom of the heap, those with few advantages, fewer skills, and no money. So I'm going to talk about the vox populi, which is the reaction against that now that we see in our uh, voting results in Western democracies. Vox populi normally is interpreted to mean uh, the majority vote, the will of the majority, but it has come to be associated with a populism uh, which is generally frowned upon by liberal Democrats. Let me say a bit more about that. In Aristotle's The Politics, written between 335 and 325 BC, you find a very fair description of democracy which he vehemently disapproved of. Its protagonists, he says, claim it as the only system that guarantees that men can share in liberty, that it is based on numerical equality rather than equality of merit. So he says, disgustedly, the poor have more sovereignty than the rich. There are regular elections and fixed terms of office Jury service, birth, wealth, and education are, he says, the defining marks of oligarchy. So their opposites, low birth, low incomes, and mechanical occupations are regarded as typical of democracy. More than two, half, uh, two and a half centuries later, the great Roman orator Cicero um, praised the early king of Rome uh, because he invented the census. The census is a very important part of our democracy now. And he approved of the census and of this action because he said it ensures that voting power was under the control not of the rabble, but of the wealthy. And he saw to it this Roman king, that the greatest number did not have the greatest power. A principle, had Cicero, we should always stand by in politics. Plato and Aristotle were, so far as we know, the first great minds to think systematically and philosophically about how to set about constructing a stable political dispensation. Their objections to democracy basically that it led to anarchy, prevailed at least until the French Revolution, but more precisely until the introduction of universal suffrage, mostly after the First World War. How could you expect a society to function, it was argued, if it was subject to the whims of the rabble, what the Germans called der Pöbel, les sans-culottes, what Shakespeare describes as the mutable and rank scented many. That's not a complimentary remark in modern English. It means smelly people who have a habit of changing their minds frequently. Hillary Clinton was more direct in referring to Trump supporters as a basket of deplorables. Popular democracy is not for the fastidious. Indeed, Stalin was so fastidious that he ruled out free elections on the entirely rational grounds that their outcomes were unpredictable. What he actually said 
according to the memoirs of a senior comrade, was that people who cast the votes decide nothing. The people who count the votes decide everything. What I'm suggesting is that many objections to democracy are entirely reasonable, or if not reasonable, logical. Jean Monnet and Robert Schumann both believed that the end station for the Euro project was ruled by enlightened technocrats that was immune to wrong-headed populism because its governance would be operated by philosopher kings, highly qualified, but somewhat above the fray of the directly elected populists. Jean-Claude Juncker made a remark of a very similar nature. As an ex-president of the European Commission, Jean Ray remarked of the 1975 referendum in the UK as to whether we should join the EEC or not, that's the 1975 one where we joined, not the referendum over Brexit, he said, a referendum on this matter consists of consulting people who don't know the problems instead of consulting the people who know them. I would deplore a situation in which the policy of this great country should be left to housewives. It should be decided instead by trained and informed people. The EEC, EU have at least been consistent in this matter, exhibiting considerable hostility to any challenge to its power emanating from referendums ever since. There are many people who believe strongly that Monet, Schumann and Rey were right and that the type of rule they advocated would banish nationalism and other calamitous isms of the 19th and 20th century, such as imperialism and colonialism. Francis Fukuyama was clear in his celebrated essay on the end of history that his model for the definitive version of democracy was indeed the EU. Nevertheless, as I believe Aristotle makes clear, this view is not that of a Democrat. It is indeed nearer to that of Plato, whose influence down the ages has been just as great as that of his one-time pupil, namely Aristotle. Against this background, I would like to unravel the current meaning of populism, a word invariably accompanied by an inaudible sniff when used in the liberal press. Merriam-Webster defines a populist as someone belonging to a political party claiming to represent the common people and further a believer in the rights, wisdom or virtues of the common people. That's pretty much the opposite of those who believe in technocracy, juristocracy, or transnational governance by global bureaucracies. The populists supported the People's Party in 1890s America, and today the Austrian Conservatives call themselves the People's Party, Österreichische Volkspartei. The American populists supported policies like an eight-hour working day, a graduated income tax, and particularly an antitrust act. In each of these concerns, they were proved prescient, particularly the antitrust act, because we see the problems we have for democracy with out of control cartels today, tax dodging international cartels. Today's populists perceive a similar reference to their uh, indifference, I'm sorry, to their interest through globalization. The rampant power of tax dodging international finance and corporations, inequality, and what they perceive as unbridled immigration. According to your political leanings, you may or may not consider these concerns correctly focused. But the fact is that they exist, numberless people with a vote share them, and the old liberal consensus has failed adequately to address them. As one German political commentator has pointed out, 70% of those voting in Germany's most recent election had not voted for the current chancellor or his party. That's on a partially um, a proportional representation system. Uh, Professors Mudd and Kaltwasser characterized current discontent on two continents 
as follows. In a world that is dominated by democracy and liberalism, populism has essentially become an illiberal response to undemocratic liberalism. They point to the fact that unelected bodies and technocratic institutions, such as the ECB and the IMF, have established control over the power of elected politicians. And this is the point who thereby exploit such bodies as a way of depoliticizing contested political issues. Of depoliticizing contested political issues. On the other hand, the post Marxist Ernesto Laclau argues that populism fosters a democratization of democracy by permitting the aggregation of demands of excluded sectors. Rather jargon esque, but I think you can understand what he means. It means really it's a safety valve, put it in common English. Let me here uh, pose some awkward questions the disillusioned populist voter might ask. How has the West got itself into a position where it appears it can easily be blackmailed by Putin's Russia and communist China? Why does globalization, which has overall reduced the numbers in the world living below the poverty level to 10%, leave the impression with so many people in the West on lower incomes that it has made them relatively poorer? Why are the relatively prosperous countries unable or unwilling to control mass migration, despite repeatedly promising their electorates to do so? Why has the denigration of Western civilization, its history and culture, theories of white privilege and its attendant dogmas, been able to get such a hold on academia in the Anglosphere? Don't worry, it's coming to you soon. Why are those who caused the financial crash of 2008 through greed and fraud overwhelmingly neither in jail nor visibly poorer? What they achieved, as one as the former Bank of England governor said, was the privatization of profits and the socialization of losses. In the theory of communicative action, 1981, Jürgen Habermas, the last icon of the Frankfurt School, has raised serious objections to the workings of contemporary democracy. The process of modernization has become dominated by economic, um, quoting or rather paraphrasing him, the process of modernization has become dominated by economic and administrative rationalization. Our everyday lives, in the Habermas view, are increasingly governed by the exigencies of the welfare state, which merges state and society. Uh, corporate capitalism, a captive press, and mass consumption. Boundaries, this goes back to something that uh, Professor Brooks yesterday said about the necessity of reviving communities at a, a micro level. Boundaries between public and private, the individual and society, the system and what Habermas calls the life world are being erased. Habermas is on the left, but some of his analysis echoes a famous book by a Trotskyist turned ultra conservative, James Burnham. The book was called The Managerial Revolution, published as early as 1941. George Orwell drew on uh, Burnham's book for his dystopian novel in uh, novel 1984. And in a long article, he summarized its predictions as follows. I'll give you just two sentences from this. The rulers of this new society uh, will be the people who effectively control the means of production. That is business executives, technicians, bureaucrats, and soldiers lumped together by Burnham under the name of managers. The new managerial societies will consist of great super states grouped around the main industrial centers in Europe, Asia, and America. And finally, and rather brazenly in a way, Orwell writes, internally 
each society will be hierarchical with an aristocracy of talent at the top and a mass of semi-slaves at the bottom. Uh, for my part, I'm coming to the end. We've got uh, a lot of people to speak who are much more expert than I am on their, in their fields. For my part, I believe that surveillance capitalism, which means data mining and manipulation, coercive bureaucracy, and expanding government, which are all linked to the digital revolution, will not disappear. Ultimately, a revolt of consumers and of voters in protection of their life world, what Habermas calls the life world, is potentially far more effective than passing endless new laws of restraint and imposing new taxes. The combined US tax code and its necessary commentaries for practitioners allegedly runs to some 70,000 pages. But the UK one, at more than 10 million words, is the world's longest. Marcel Proust's A la recherche du temps perdu is the longest novel ever written. The UK tax code is eight times longer and considerably less readable. This is a world built for managers who can afford expensive lawyers and accountants. Nevertheless, this is my conclusion, it is still far from being such an evil as being obliged to carry a smartphone in China that awards social, which is to say political points of credit or debit to your behavior 24 seven, every day, every night, from which you will receive advantages from the communist state or disadvantages and penalties. Even George Orwell never conceived of such an efficient totalitarianism. I leave the floor now open to our experts. <laughs>